All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another day of Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Friday, December 17th of 2021. Happy Friday. Thanks for tuning into the stream today. First off, a big congrats to Saber Sim Ross, solo shipping the first down and the play action uh, for last night's Thursday night football game. Uh, I'm pretty sure ended up winning by like a full six point margin uh, and took down both of those contests with a unique lineup, the same lineup uh, that actually took down the Millie for a good, probably a 30K hit there or something like that for Ross. Uh, I was talking to him a bit this morning and he said that uh, he was actually already asleep uh, when that when that game ended. So uh, woke up to uh, a nice surprise there, a nice Christmas present, and didn't even have to go through uh, the process of sweating the game out. So um, I feel like it's uh, having a having a big DFS sweat is kind of a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, it's it's definitely fun when you're in it, but given how often I think it ends up letting you down, sometimes it's better to just sleep through the sweat and wake up to the winnings. But um, anyway, let's go ahead. We'll go ahead and start jumping into things here. We've got uh, a few interesting topics to talk about here today. Uh, we've got an interesting two-game NFL slate tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about two-game NFL strategy here. Uh, there was a question about NBA showdowns. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about NBA showdowns. And then also uh, some more follow-up from NFL showdowns. We talked a lot about NFL showdowns yesterday, um, but there were a couple other follow-up messages that came, came in through support. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit those as well. So as always... Feel free to pop your questions into YouTube chat, into the Office Hours channel in Slack. We'll tackle things in roughly chronological order, the order that they come in here. But let's go ahead and get things started here. Um, this is a question from LJ. This is about the two-game Saturday slate, and I think this is a good place to start. So uh, he said, what is y'all's thoughts on the two-games classic Saturday slate? The games look disgusting. Uh, not sure if it would be worth the time and gamble to even play it. Wondering how you guys handle ones like this. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, okay. So first of all, I mean, if the games, like if the games aren't looking good, you're not interested in, in just like even building lineups for the games, like no problem with skipping the slate. Um, but with pretty much anything football related, uh, just like the Thanksgiving slate here um, or, or practically any showdown, like even Sunday, even, even games in the Sunday main slates, there's so many people playing these contests. This contests are so soft. That I, from a contest selection standpoint, can pretty much recommend playing virtually anything they have in the football lobby. Uh, so if you want to play this slate, I, I'm, I've got things going on. I'm not going to be able to play this slate. I think I'll probably end up playing the night game showdown. Um, but if you want to play this slate, I say go for it because the contests are going to look pretty good. Like at least from all of our contest selection principles, effective entrance, things like that. Uh, there's going to be, the contests are going to be pretty soft. They're going to be pretty playable overall. Um, when you're actually approaching the strategy of this slate, I think it's it's similar to kind of what we talk about with some of the Thanksgiving Day slates, the three games, um, especially with just two games here. I think you, you definitely get pushed a little bit more in the direction of almost approaching this like a showdown, right? This is going to be maximum variance, right? You have, you do have two games to choose from, but since you're filling out a full, what is it? Eight or nine player lineup here, right? You're going to have some crazy high ownerships on certain guys. Uh, there's going to be, it, there's going to be probably some low owned plays that maybe catch a touchdown or, or something like that, that end up kind of being a must. Uh, the rules of correlation here, like your traditional rules of correlation, I would say can pretty much just get tossed out of the window. Um, I will mention, since it's a good opportunity, Daniel asked a question here yesterday, and he said, I was wondering with tomorrow's two-game slate, is there no way getting around a lineup with a QB and defense from the same game? Um, and I would say, I mean, you can if you want to eliminate those kinds of lineups. Um, but by default, we're going to allow those kinds of lineups into your build. Correlation is off. And... I, I am perfectly fine letting a little bit of negative correlation show up in my lineup if there's a set of game sims that kind of supports it, knowing that it's going to help differentiate me. Uh, it's probably going to help me build a little bit more of a unique lineup overall. So I would I would approach this slate. You know, I, I like the way the default sliders look. I'm not super concerned with correlation. Uh, I would be very aggressive with ownership. I would make sure that I've got at least probably a couple low-owned, more like dart throw type plays uh, in each lineup. Um, and obviously you definitely with, with almost any contest that you're going to find out there, even, okay. So with the exception of maybe some of the smaller single entry type stuff, you're going to see that we're going to recommend single game simulations to build 
each individual lineup. Um, we had a question for the Thanksgiving Day slate when we were talking about this, about should I adjust max salary to avoid duplication? Um, I think it's interesting. I don't think you need to be too aggressive with it. There are a lot more lineup combinations here than there are on an NFL showdown. I don't know if you need to do this as as much. Um, maybe if you're playing some of the really large field stuff, I would like explore maybe even just taking this down to 100 um, or maybe 300 um, and see what we get. Um, I wouldn't set any kinds of stacking rules. Personally, this is just me. Again, I, I could honestly care less about correlation. If I get correlated combinations of players in the lineup, it's more about that that it just worked for that particular sim, and I'm less concerned about trying to like create average correlation in the lineup. Um, but let's run a build. Let's just kind of see what some of these lineups are looking like, especially with just how weird the slate is probably going to be. Um, and we'll see if I have anything else to, to add on here. But... I think the default sliders are going to do pretty good. I, I think also too, this is going to be high variance. Um, but anytime we're anytime we have an opportunity to use single game simulations to build lineups, um, and we're playing a really high variance game like this, I think it's it's a situation where, in particular, Saber Sim can really just excel uh, because people are going to probably, especially in softer contests under three dollars, large field kind of stuff, they're going to do stuff like they're going to create. Well, first of all, you've got an entire group of people that's probably just going to be like hand building lineups or whatever. But then there's this this other group of people that's probably going to be building here with, um, you know, creating rules that are removing winning winning combination winning that are removing positive EV lineups from their pool, right? Creating rules that are requiring stacks and avoiding negative correlation and these things like that that I just literally don't think you need to do when you have the sims at your disposal. So. Um, I, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at just kind of what some of these lineups are looking like, and I'll see if there's anything that's jumping out to me. But I do, I mean, I love the idea here uh, of getting these kind of lower owned punts um, and just like trying to build some combinations of players um, that are a little bit more unique, right? If you're getting dart throws, if you're getting multiple darts in your lineup, I love that. I like, I'm, I'm going to say I would love lineups that leave a lot of salary on the table because they're absolutely going to be viable. Um, I think you can, I mean, here's a big punt play, right? All of this stuff definitely works. It definitely makes sense for a slate like this. Um, if you are partial to, we've been talking a lot this past week about a strategy in NFL showdowns. I think even yesterday we were talking about this a lot of kind of doing a little bit more hand picking of your lineups, right? Um, especially if you're playing 20 or less, I think you can kind of intentionally go through your pool and spotlight particular lineups that have combinations of players that you think are going to be like unlikely to be used, lower salary, um, whatever. I like this lineup too, even though it's using a lot of the salary. I think you've got a low-owned punt play uh, in Jalen Richard, um, who, again, right, especially correlated with, with Derek Carr um, in a larger stack of this game easy to see a situation where he ends up in the optimal um, combined with a guy like Josh Jacobs. This is going to be a lineup. That's pretty unlikely. Also two players playing against the same team defense, right? Like you're getting a lineup here. That's probably pretty unlikely to be duplicated by um, another player. And you've got real nice high saber score on this lineup. So um, yeah, I mean, overall, I guess the last thing I would note here is in, in the same way, talking about this being a higher variance game, I, I this isn't a, I would not go uh, play a crazy amount of bankroll on this, right? Um, it's going to play very similarly like Showdown, where uh, you may be up, you may be watching the game, you might be up 4x, one play goes by, and you're now down, you're winning back 50% of your entry fees, uh, then somebody scores, and you're uh, slightly break even, and then then you're up, like, it's, there's going to be, it's going to be very high variance and I'd, I'd recommend similarly to what we recommend for the showdowns uh scale back the bankroll a little bit play this for a sweat enjoy the fact that you're probably playing some soft contests um but they're tough to win so but um i may i may have may end up entering depending on how it works out um this start time 4 30 p.m eastern is gonna be a little tight for me so might just end up playing that night game showdown but we'll see i mean it's definitely an interesting slate here for sure um, I'm very curious how much ownership Nick Mullins actually gets given the point per dollar salary savings that he's going to allow people to have. Um, I think monitoring the ownership is, is an interesting one. Um, I would also say this, I always come on here and people say, where are the opportunities to find, to add value by editing projections? Where should I look to ed edit projections first? And what I always say is look for unpredictable situations. There's a very unpredictable situation tomorrow. I mean, Anything could become unpredictable here, depending on what what happens with COVID stuff. But uh, we've already got this very weird situation with the Cleveland team, right? Nick Mullins is is throwing the ball. Not a lot of information 
out there on Nick Mullins and definitely not a lot on the Browns. I think this is his first game with the Browns. Um, so if you've got a read or you don't even need a read necessarily, if you, if you want to take a shot at this, um, I would, I would be very interested to see both with Saber Sims ownership projections and kind of just on social media and what the buzz around the industry looks like. And maybe, you know, in some other sites, videos, like how are people talking about Nick Mullins? Uh, because if he ends up becoming a bit more popular, right? The perception of the Raiders defense is not that it is a good defense. If he ends up becoming a little bit more popular because of the savings, just from a game theory standpoint, I'd be kind of interested in taking the fade side of that. That would be my kind of approach. Um, but if he is, if this, if you do get this kind of ownership and he is the lowest owned QB of this group of four, then I kind of like the idea more that he's plays pretty competently. He's got good weapons there. Um, every, everybody on the Browns is going to be cheap relative to their expectation. Then I kind of like that side a little bit more. Um, but I think that's probably the most interesting kind of pivot point of the entire slate is is really you know how do how do how do people project the Browns around the industry uh, and how what does the ownership end up shaking out with Browns players around the industry? So because I mean this Colts and Patriots game, if this were on a main slate or something like that, is not going to be a game that people were rushing to play, especially the passing attack of these two teams. Um, but that might be what happens or it might not. Right. Uh, or maybe everybody plays car. I don't, I don't know at the moment. I don't know um, exactly how I feel about that, but that would be probably my favorite place to study uh, on the slate and key into a bit, seeing how the field is going to navigate those players, those quarterbacks in particular. So, but should be fun. And I think we have another one of these on um, Christmas day next week on Saturday. So um, should be exciting to see that as well. See how that all shakes out. Maybe get a practice of playing some of these two game slates here um, and get an opportunity to, to try it again on uh, next Saturday, but high variance. I think Sabersim can excel at this because we have the game simulations at our disposal. Um, but with all that said, I would, I would play a little less bankroll than you typically are playing for Sunday main slates. So, but good, good question there. Um, let's go ahead. I'm going to jump, jump, hit this question real quick from, from Joshua, and then we'll keep moving forward. So Joshua said, I have a late swap question. Let's say you're playing NBA and decide you need a late swap. Does late swap automatically swap players into your lineup, no matter what, or if no Sims have shown anything different, will it leave the same player? Um, if the latter is the case, then why not late swap a few minutes before the start of each game, no matter what? So it, it, it can, it can swap players even if no news has changed with those players or those games or if the projections haven't changed at all so if you're playing nba for example let's pop over to nba and let's say you're swapping um at six o'clock my local time here so three games have already started and let's say maybe you are late swapping because uh you get news that drew middleton isn't or drew middleton <laughs> uh drew holiday isn't playing for the bucks Giannis is out so i can't use my Giannis, my Giannis one so you get, let's say you get news that Drew Holiday's out for the Bucks tonight, right? So you're late swapping for that news, right? Um, but even in a lineup that didn't have any Bucks players in it, it might get shifted around a little bit because in the late swap process, we're going to reselect a random bucket of Sims based on where your Sim variant slider is set and rebuild the lineups around them. Um, and the nice thing about that is that even if you're mostly swapping for the Drew Holiday news, maybe we got some news that a different starter is going to play um, in this game, like something that didn't really affect things that much, but a little bit of change of projections. Maybe our minutes slightly got a little bit more dialed in into the Lakers and Timberwolves game or something like that. So you get to take advantage of all that at once. Um, but overall, jo Joshua says, why not just late swap a few minutes before the start of each game? I mean, I think that's a viable strategy, especially if Sims are running. But if no Sims have ran at all, you don't, you, all you are doing essentially is just mixing up your lineups and, and kind of re rerunning everything if that's the case. So um, there's nothing kind of stopping a player from getting moved in or out based on the way that the Sims are randomly bucketed on the late swap. Or, yeah, so. Would you suggest doing blind late swaps just in case? Um, I mean, it's up to you. I don't, so personally, I don't really want, like, when I can avoid it, I don't want to have to go back to the computer and rebuild everything every single game start. Um, so what I've typically been using is I use basketball monster and they have this player news tab. So it's basketball monster. It's if you just go to basketball monster, it's up here in the news. Right. Um, and what I will typically do is I'll use this combined with the Sims notifications in Slack. So let's say again, it's six o'clock and I see that a new Sim runs for Spurs jazz. Right. 
we'll all go and check Basketball Monster, and they'll say something like, uh, maybe um, Mike Conley is sitting tonight to rest, right? And I say, oh, okay, something actually changed. This Sim's running because something in the game really legitimately changed, and I'm going to rebuild for this. Um, but if not, sometimes I won't. Um, you might, I mean, if the sim ran, it's probably likely that a couple minutes got shifted around and there may be some micro edge there that you could take advantage of by, by swapping. Um, if you are unsure of if it makes sense to swap and you can't really tell based on the news, what happened, I would always recommend doing it. But for me personally, I have a pretty good sense of like when news is breaking and like what impact that has on the game and whether or not I want to swap just, just based on the combined, the combination of these tools. So I, that's what I typically do. I don't blind swap before every single game start, but I will swap if Sims run and um, there's a, some kind of apparent news that I think I'm taking taking advantage of. So, but cool. Let's keep it going here. I'm going to jump over this question from from six. Um, and uh, this is kind of a follow up, more more NFL showdown stuff here. Um. But he said, I know it's not practical to try and force SaberSim to generate winning lineups after the fact, but I wanted to ask your opinion or thoughts on a general approach for player pool curation during step one. I was noticing a very low-owned player that helped vault another SaberSim user to the top of the leaderboard. But after running it back and eliminating filters and rules, I wasn't even able to get... I wasn't really being given that specific player in any of my lineups, let alone being nothing, lucky enough to generate the right combination. I used 0010 sliders generated a 1500 sim pool generate and spent a good amount of time sifting through hundreds of lineups and found maybe one instance where the specific player was even included in a lineup. Just wanted your opinion on aside from not recommending me to continue to try, try and recreate magnificence. I'd like some tips on how to maybe loosen the reins enough on future showdowns to allow Saber Sim to even consider uh, players with a 99 percentile outcome. Shout out to Ross Kosh. That is Saber Sim Ross. Um, and he said he took down uh, the first down 20 max. He also took down the play action uh, with running back Phenom Michael Burton of the Kansas City Chiefs. So let's get into this. So we'll, let's answer this question kind of generally here. I'm not, I don't even want to use last night's slate because I think it is just far more interesting here to do this with uh, a game that's upcoming, right? So let's talk about this. So let's build, let's build some lineups for the night game tomorrow night. Let's see what we're looking at. And we'll do exactly... What was said was being done here. 1,500 lineups. We'll leave max salary here a little bit lower. Great. Correlation, zero. Ownership fade, zero. We're just going to basically take 1,500 sims of this game and build the optimal. And the question here is, Cody does make a good point. Zero ownership fade is going to make you get less of those players in general. That is a good point. Um, the, the ownership fade, because the players that are likely to be significantly lower owned than the average players in the pool are likely to be the players that are very... Uh, low projected anyway, right? Um, the Michael Burton last night, I think was projected for less than a point. We actually talked about this on stream yesterday. I think someone was asking, uh, a, we were talking about like target scores, like what does a player that is 200 min salary on an NFL showdown need to get to be optimal in the lineup? And it was, I think, rather funny that we ended up kind of getting that outcome from Michael Burton, who had basically his 99th percentile outcome in the game. Um, but let's let's just look at what we're getting here um, and see what we're getting overall. So this is just 20, right? Um, you will see, I mean, especially with just 20 lineups, you'll see some lower projected players, some min salary guys start to poke in here. Um, if you especially expand your pool, um, you'll, you'll see that these guys are definitely showing up in the pool, right? Um, these projected under a point guys, right? We're getting... We're getting some lineups with these guys. Now, it's, I mean, they don't project very well, right? We're not getting a ton of lineups with these guys. As the average point projection increases, they start to show up in more and more. Um, but it's, it's. We're, I guess the point here that I'm trying to make is that, like, it is hard to get the Michael Burton guy in your lineup. But the Sims pick up on the fact that occasionally these guys do have the outcome that gets there. Um, if you want to just blindly kind of force more of these guys into your pool and just say, I want more of these guys showing up. Um, one thing that I think can kind of have that effect is just changing it to the 99th percentile and saying like, show me what happens when everybody gets their 99th percentile outcome. Um, and it becomes, okay. So it actually looks like for this particular game, it's diluting that pool, um, a little bit more. Like some of these low salary guys aren't showing up at all here. Um, but I think that can be one way to do it on a per game basis, right? 
Um, tomorrow night's game doesn't really look like a good example of that. Um, the other thing I think that can be kind of useful is to just intentionally go get some of these guys. And I can't speak to necessarily what Ross did or what his process looked like here uh, to get access to some of these players. But if you've got a read on one of these guys, right? Showdown is variant enough. If you've got a read, and I don't know if there was a report that Michael Burton was going to be involved in the offense at all. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. I know when we had the Derek Gore game from the Kansas City showdown game a couple weeks ago, there was a, a coach quote that came out that said Derek Gore was going to be involved. Um, if you've got a read in these, I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of planting a flag here either on a particular low projected player, if you think they're going to be involved, maybe, you know, just looking through this, um, I think Ashton Doolin could potentially be that guy. If it was me, if I was just trying to like literally with more of a gut feel with not a lot of research here, kind of plant a flag. Um, I mean, he's pretty involved in the offense. and is a, as a, uh, somebody that Wentz looks for down the field too. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with intentionally just going and trying to get some of these guys as your kind of low owned punt. Right. And maybe 50% is ridiculous for 20 lineups. Maybe it isn't, depending on your risk tolerance. Um, the reality is, though, here is that in a 1500 lineup build with 0010, uh, 0010 sliders, right? You're going to get these guys showing up in your lineups. They're not going to show up in 20% of your lineups, but they are going to show up. You're going to get lineups with these players in them, right? The builder is going to make some decision based on looking at the individual Sims that came up, whether it makes sense to include the lineups that include these players in your top 20 or your top 150. And because they don't get there often, I think you're not always easily going to see them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. That doesn't mean they're not optimal, right? That doesn't mean you can't go get them yourself, I guess. Um, Cody's, Cody said here, uh, I would also... Just think if you want more of those, you either have to set a min exposure or you can just add a, add a little bit more ownership fade, in my opinion. But realize for every Burton you get, you are going to get others that fail. Yeah, uh, last night I had the exact same lineup as as uh, Ross did, um, but I had Blake Bell instead of Michael Burton. Two, another min salary 200 player. Um, scored zero points. Kind of happens. Um, I would say the last thing I'll note here is so if you do kind of just generically want to get more of these players showing up in your lineups, I think one thing you can do is just kind of give some of these guys like a little boost here at the bottom. Not by a lot, but I'm like talking about like something even like this of just trying to say like bump these guys median medians up a little bit and maybe you even come up to here and do something like this. And I don't, I don't know. I haven't done this. I haven't tried this, but I'm curious what results we get out of this. So you're bumping up some of that, that like bottom tier of player here and then keep, let's keep ownership fade on like Cody mentioned and try this again. And I would suspect, I would expect here that we get a little bit more exposure. Six said, I want to say that the default slider for ownership is zero or one anyway. It depends on the contest you're playing. If you're playing large field, it isn't, it should be three. So I think for like maybe some smaller fields, some single entry, smaller field stuff, it, it does go to zero or one. Um, but okay. So six said, unfortunately, I'm also working within the limitations of being limited to only 20 lineups based on my tier sub. Okay. So if that's the case, then what I would recommend doing, um, is, so I have my 20 lineups here. So what we did is we, we boosted some of those lower projected players, right? Just gave them a little light boost. We increased the ownership fade slider to three or so here at this point, right? We're going to start getting some of these guys showing up here, but I would I would add to this um, and see if you can put an ear to the ground of beat writers and coach quotes before the game and see if there's any reason, right? Any reason to just kind of want to take a shot on one of these guys. Because in reality, before, when you don't have the hindsight, like it's hard to be like, who's the guy, right? Like, is is Kylan Granson going to be involved in some red zone looks? Like maybe, like it's perfectly fine as a plant flag on a showdown slate where the most important thing to your EV is just getting different anyway. Is Ashton Dooling going to be more involved, right? Like is JJ, like uh, Coach Belichick is going to do, you don't know, who knows what he's going to do with his running backs, right? In fact, I like maybe, this is actually one I would probably like a little bit more as long as JJ Taylor's in. But it's hard without the hindsight to know which of these guys it is. And I think like you could, go get a couple of them, right? Like give me a couple give me a couple shots on some of these guys here. 
I'm just looking to see if there's any names that kind of just jump out to me for like some reason I might want to play them, right? Let's go pick some like low salary guys and just get these guys in here. Right? You could also, so I think you could take a wide approach here and just start making sure that like individual lineups have exposure to some of these guys. Um, or you could plant a flag and go get one of them, right? So, Cody said these guys can be in the winning lineup just because they kept one catch for one, a touchdown and one yard. It's super volatile. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's basically what you are counting on or hoping to happen here for most of these guys. So, Adam said, sometimes instead of adjusting the filter, I'll just bump the players I want over it a bit so they'll filter in instead of others at the same price range. Yeah, for, for showdowns, for NFL showdowns, I don't touch the filter at all. I want it at zero. I just want players that have a, a positive point projection at all to be in there. Um, and that's it. But yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 kind of I think overall my best advice here. Um I mean the the positive news here is you know a, a traditional tool here is essentially never going to give you one of these guys in a lineup because they're never actually going to make like a projected optimal. They just they're just not going to be there. The fact that they're showing up when we build 1500 lineups at all is is a a powerful part of the process. It's an indicative that like the sims are are doing something for you. Um, if you want to get more of them, I think kind of wrapping this question up, if you want to just generically get more of these guys or have more access to them, I would bump their projections a little bit, give the builder a little bit more of a reason. Like in reality, the difference of being projected one point average versus 0.5 points average is, is not a massive change, but it's going to give them a little bit of a bump up your ownership fade. Um, and then, you know, especially, I know it sounds like you're on the starter plan. I would just explore leaking some ownership, some exposure into these guys using the minimum exposure settings. So six that I understand, uh, just wanted to see if there was something I can do to force more of those flag pants into the simulation. Yeah. I mean, they, they are there already. What you are doing is you're, 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 you're selecting for them. Right. So, I mean, let me put this another way, right? Like the builder has a strong sense of upside. And when you build your 1500 lineups and you get your 20 out at the top, it's saying these are the 20 that probably have the highest upside in the individual Sims we ran. That's assuming you have no ownership settings or anything like that. That's basically what it's saying. The one thing that the builder doesn't very, very much have a strong sense of is duplication. And I think you could, I think you can make a very strong argument that it even makes sense sacrificing maybe a little bit of raw upside to leak exposure into these very low projected players right? In the interest of getting a lineup that is much lower, much less likely to be duplicated, right? That's, that's really what made Ross's lineup so spectacular. And that's what made his ROI so high, right? Is that like, yes, it was a good, it was a good lineup. The lineup had an upside. Clearly it was the optimal, but it was also unique, right? That's kind of the most profound aspect of it. And SaberSim has a good idea of identifying and quantifying upside, but it doesn't necessarily know exactly how likely the lineup is to be duplicated. And by filtering through and saying, no, I don't want the 20 that SaberSim gave me by default. I want the 20 of the 1500 pool that I built. I'm going to choose few, a few that I think are extremely unlikely to be duplicated. That's kind of the approach I think you can take here. So the the the, the flag plants, these stands, these punt plays, they're already there. Um, you just, in some ways, need to go and go get them and tell them to then pull those lineups out of the 1500 and into your 20. And this isn't even the only way to do that. Right? There are other ways to build unique lineups. We talk about it here all the time. Um, a lineup with a bunch of chalky plays that is 4,600, right? 47, eight, maybe, right? Might be a lower chance of being duplicated. A lineup in a game with an 11 point spread where you're using a five, one stack of the underdog, even if, if you're using maximum salary and every player is over 10% owned, might also not be duplicated. So there are other ways to do it. I think this is just kind of one way to do it um, amongst amongst a lot of options. So um, Six said, I didn't even consider it, but when I raise the ownership slider from three to an eight, it gives me more of those guys. So I appreciate the comment that helps. Yeah, and that's I think that's another just kind of a br brute force way of getting there as well. So. Um, let's hit this question real quick. Young Stunna said, why is Saberson graying players out at the bottom? Um, they're in and they're in the winning lineup. So 
we will have a minimum filter for any given sport that filters out some players at the bottom. For NFL Showdown, it's just going to be players that have a projection, right? So we'll say include players where my projection is greater than zero. If you don't want this, you can just click that. You can click the zero, um, but you still won't get any of these guys because they have a zero projection, right? According to our Sims, they never, they don't play. Um, if you have a read on the fact, like maybe you, maybe there was something that came out that you had a good reason to believe that Marlon Mack is going to be involved. And again, this isn't final projections. I, this will run more Sims tomorrow, but maybe, maybe something comes out that makes you think that Marlon Mack is going to be involved, right? You can give him a projection. You can remove that. You don't even have to remove the filter in that case. You can give him a projection, right? And now you'll probably start getting some of him in your Sims. Um, for a sport like NBA, for example, right? We do the same thing, but this filter is quite a bit higher. So we'll set this filter at 15. So all these players here at the bottom, right, are going to be filtered out. Not even just players that are out, but also some players that have a projection. Let's see if we can get to some players that have a projection here. Oops, too far. Um, right here, we're going to start filtering players that are projected for 15 or less points. The main reason why is that these players are typically kind of bench warmer types that aren't likely to play. Um, they take up a lot of opportunity cost in the lineup. And there's also a ton of volatility here, right? Like even projecting these players for a mean outcome ends up becoming kind of difficult. The downside of these players can be very high as well. Um, that said, a few options. You can remove the filter completely and say, build lineups with everyone in the pool. That's great. Uh, you can set a lower filter if you want. Maybe you say a minimum projection of 15 is too low. I'm going to set a minimum projection of 12, right? So you can do that like there. Um, to be completely honest, though, I, especially in, actually in both NFL and NBA, not showdown, but main slates, I actually end up raising this is what I do. Um, I typically like to leave mine for NBA at a little bit more like 18, right? I think players that are projected for 16 and a half or so points with a, basically a maximum ceiling of 26, 27, 28 points, something like that, right? I don't even want to include in my pool. I don't want them showing up in my lineups. I think they're, I think even at their, essentially their maximum ceiling, the opportunity cost of rostering a player on an eight game slate that only scores 25 points is too high for that lineup to be successful. So I raise it, um, but you don't have to. And I, I think it will just make your lineups probably a little bit more volatile if you lower it or remove it completely. Um, there are a lot of ways to lose at DFS. There are more ways to lose than win. So, I mean, these guys, there are going to be slates where you set a minimum projection of 15 even or 18 or 21 or whatever it is. And, uh, you get some weird situation that ends up leading to a Nas Reed 40 point game, right? He has a, basically his 99th and a half percentile outcome. Maybe Towns gets into foul trouble in the first quarter or gets hurt or something like that. Right. And you just lose that night. Um, you can't protect against all the different ways you can lose in DFS, but I think on average, it is too risky for my personal style of play to include these players in the pool. Um, I think they are, I think they are unlikely to be optimal on the average slate. Um, so on a four or five game slate, three game slate, I may take the filter off or lower it back down to 15 or 12 or something like that. But in general, I think it's valuable having it on, despite the fact that on occasion there are going to be situations where a player is not even in your player pool that breaks the slate. But you can't roster every player anyway. That's the other side of it, right? Even of even amongst the players that are in the pool, with 20 or even 150 lineups, you can't have everybody. So there's going to be slates where even the guy that is in your pool, you just have zero of and he breaks the slate and you lose anyway. That's kind of what I mean about, oh, there's a lot of ways to lose. You can't protect, you can't protect against every way you could possibly lose. You can't get exposure to everybody. You can't have every player. It's the way it is. So, but the filter is on there to begin with so that we think we, I guess, let me put it this way. We think that the average lineup built with Sabersim is better having the filter on there than not. So that's why it's on, but good question. Um, okay, cool. Let's talk about this question here from, from Adam. Came in through Slack uh, since we have the time. He said, could you talk about NBA showdown strategy a bit? I've been getting into this a bit and I noticed the top players are at least recognizable ones. Max enter these and seem unconcerned with dupes. Given that NBA fantasy points are more predictable than other sports. Well, maybe not this week. 
is there a different path towards positive long-term ROI playing NBA showdowns than other sports, especially as field size gets bigger, but a game's projection is more stable? So first off, I did an NBA showdowns video at the start of the season. I linked it in Slack as a reply to this comment. It's an hour long. Um, go check it out if you're interested in playing these, but we'll talk about NBA showdowns for a bit. Uh, I think there's a few things at play here. I think there's a, a few different sides to this question. Uh, the first being that, and this isn't so much like on a useful strategy level, but I think especially the grinders, the guys, these these pros or whatever that are playing the main slate, every short slate and every showdown every night, maxing basically every contest under the sun that is out there available. Uh, there, I don't, I don't think there's as much time available in the slate to key into every single individual game and make an intentional effort to avoid duplication. Avoiding duplication is hard. It's not easy to do. And I think it requires, even with an extremely sophisticated custom built optimizer or model or something like that, it requires some manual attention to look at. And I think part of the reason you might be seeing that, especially these familiar names that you might see in every single contest, regardless of slate or size or sport or whatever, right? You, you guys know kind of who I'm probably like talking about. Um, I think probably what's happening is they're using a tool, understanding that they're likely to be duplicated a bit and but just playing almost like a, playing the best lineups they can and, and going with the flow. Um, with that said, though, from a strategy standpoint, I also think there's a good argument to be a little bit less concerned with duplication in NBA Showdown um, for a few reasons. One, the contests are quite a bit smaller. Uh, the chance, the raw probability of a lineup being duplicated is quite a bit lower. And what you stand to lose if you are heavily duplicated is a little bit lower, right? Like you can lose a ton of EV if you are duplicated hundreds of times in an NFL showdown with 150 entries. If you're playing a basketball showdown with 5,000 entries, right? Your chance, your raw probability of being duplicated is much lower and the expected value you lose is also quite a bit lower. You also have less tools at your disposal, I think, to avoid duplication than you do in a sport like football. There are less players that are viable to be used both at the captain positions and at the flex positions in NBA. And you can test that just by running builds and seeing what your player pools look like. But if we run some NBA showdown builds, right, there are typically, there's a typically a smaller pool of viable captains. There's probably a smaller pool of viable flex players. Uh, there's... NBA is not an event sport, so there is no situation where the min salary guy catches a touchdown uh, from the one yard out and has a, uh, what is, like a 30x salary night. That, that can't happen in NBA. It's not likely to happen. So it's it's just frankly a little bit harder to avoid du duplication from the standpoint of player pool. I also think your ability to use max salary as a blunt force tool to avoid um, duplication goes down a little bit because in NBA salary is much more correlated with actual fantasy points, right? You can afford to basically say, just, I'm just throwing away 500 salary from my entire pool of 150 lineups in NFL because player salary doesn't correlate as consistently with actual fantasy points. But in NBA, as you drop down max salary, you start sacrificing average points more quickly. So you you lose a lot of tools here that are, that are at your disposal that you would have access to in an NFL showdown or a baseball showdown or something like that when you're playing NBA. Um, so we can look at this here. Um, and I guess, I mean, we see some like rarer captain kinds of lineups here, but these are showing up in one of 1500. I don't put a lot of stock into that. Um, I think as we kind of move our way up, there's just a, a much higher concentration of the top overall players showing up in the captain spot in your pool of 1500 in NBA than in other sports. Um, I think it's a lot harder to, to build lineups that are unique. You also don't have the opportunity to take advantage of the, the negative correlation in the same way in NBA, right? You can get kind of QB versus opposing defense and same team, two running backs, same team, two tight ends and do weird stuff like that in NFL that other people just aren't likely to do. And it doesn't transfer that over as well to NBA. Um, so all of this to answer the question of like, why are top players not really seem so in, seeming so concerned with duplication? I think all of this plays into it. One is that it's harder to avoid duplication. You stand to gain less from putting the time in to avoid it. And you're just frankly, a lot less likely to be duplicated because the contests are smaller. Um, that said, I think NBA showdown with SaberSim can actually be really profitable um, because again, of the game simulations right? 
So even though with NBA not being as much of an event sport, I think it's a little bit harder to track through the play-by-play cadence of a game and why a simulation matters, but it does, right? Different players are going to get minutes in the fourth quarter based on the way that a game is working out, right? Uh, One player's ceiling outcome game is going to affect the ability of another player in the game to get that ceiling outcome, right? If you're looking at uh, Stephen Curry and Andrew Wiggins, right? Uh, if, If Wiggins is having just a crazy night, he's going off, right? It's, it's going to remove opportunities at the ceiling outcome for Curry to get there, right? The Sims pick up on the, on these kinds of things. Um, I think one of the most powerful things behind the, the simulations too, is that we allow for some minutes variance. I actually took down the, uh, Nuggets and Timberwolves showdown from two nights ago now on FanDuel. Um, just throwing a couple dummy lineups in there. I, I really didn't actually do that much. I just built a couple lineups and then handpicked a few that had Anthony Edwards in a multiplier spot because I was excited to watch him play. Um, and ended up taking it down with uh, a the I had uh, Jokic MVP. This was on FanDuel. Jokic MVP, Town Star, uh, Anthony Edwards Pro. So very predictable there. But I had Zeke Naji and um, is it Jalen or which what which of the McDaniel's brothers is on the Timberwolves? I can't remember. The whatever whatever one it is, right? Um, and as I was looking at that lineup after, right? And I watched this game. I watched this game live, right? Both teams kind of had this like game of chicken of almost playing big against each other, right? Like both teams have two big centers right and they have bench players that are available that can also play big and we had like Jokic and Towns going at it all night um, but the second units played big too and there was a lot of time where like Zeke Naji was playing alongside Jokic and McDaniels was playing alongside Towns right and like all of these bigs were on the floor right and like the the Sims can pick up on the way that teams match up against each other and who is likely to play minutes based on other players in the game and the flow of the game and the pace of the game that is beyond just looking at things from an average projection. So I think that's kind of how play-by-play simulation ends up mattering a little bit more in NBA. Even though it's not an event-based sport, it doesn't always translate as well to like, oh, well, one team's ahead, so the other team's not going to throw the ball kinds of things. Um, So it's interesting. I I think it can definitely be profitable overall. And I think the biggest thing is that NBA is such a grind already. Um, It's such a pain to, to manage the late swaps and things like that, that, I haven't really added showdowns into my strategy too much because I've been playing main slates um, and late swapping and doing things like that, but I think they're profitable. So I I definitely, and I think uh, in particular, I think FanDuel's product for the NBA with the MVP star and pro is pretty cool. Uh, I think it's, I think it's pretty unique, uh, pretty unique. So I might explore that a little bit more. Um, check that out. But Adam said, I've been thinking about just playing NBA showdown. I, I think even that's an interesting idea. I know some of the Sabres and guys for NFL this season have been playing only NFL showdown, right? Skipping the main sites and playing every single showdown. Um, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. It also smooths out your variance, right? Because you silo, you silo one game. So like, let's say you're just horribly wrong on the way that the golden state warriors and Boston game plays out right? Maybe you have no exposure to that game, right? You think the game's going to go way under a slow paced game and it just, it goes to double overtime or it goes 20 points over the over and right. That can ruin your whole main slate because of the way that you, you captured that game. But when you're playing just the showdowns, that game is just siloed into only that game. So you lose all your entry fees on that showdown. You're on to the next one. Um, Even though the individual games of showdown are higher variance, playing all of them, I think can smooth out your variance. So I think it's interesting. I thought about doing this. I did it for one NFL Sunday and it, ended up just being kind of like a break even day, but I think it's interesting. So Aaron said games postponed. What got postponed? Was it NFL? Or was it basketball? What happened? Someone's got to tell me, but we'll see. I don't know. Maybe someone could tell me. Um, all right. Let's see. Let's jump back. Uh, Clay said, for my core plays, why can't I set the min to 50% and the max to 10, 100% on five players? When I build, it said that exceeds the limit. I don't know. Let's look. Let's try to do it. I assume this is for basketball. Oh, so there's Matt says NFL moved games to Monday, Tuesday. So there's nothing tomorrow now, huh? All right. Interesting. Um, let's go back to Clay's question here. Wow, that's crazy. 
maybe maybe that's better. I, I'm I'm nervous about this whole thing, but we'll see. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's just try this. So let's assume. I don't know that your core is Jokic. So you set a minimum exposure of 50 to Jokic. Some of this might be positional, right? I'm just going to pick some random guys out here um, that like seem to project for decent values. Let's pick Harrison Barnes. Um, let's pick uh, Chris Middleton. But like there could be positional or salary issues of setting these exposures to all of these different guys. That's that's like my first best guess. Um, let's do DeMarcus Cousins. Wow. He's probably going to be pretty chalky, right? Um, and Tristan Thompson, right? I assume, I actually, I think this might, I actually think this already might be a positional issue because there are, yeah. Okay. So like, actually you couldn't do this combination of players. And I just picked these ones out of the, out of the sand, right? Because I have three center slash util spots here. Uh, so you won't be able to, so I think that would be the first thing to check on is make sure that you don't have positional concerns, but let's go ahead and let's remove, let's remove Jokic and use a different pay up guy as our example. Let's use uh, LeBron. Let's see what happens here. We don't need 1500 lineups. Let's do 500. So, I mean, it looks like it's it's building here. I would say the biggest thing is I would look at the positions uh, and salaries of players and checking and making sure that, like, it's a viable combination. But it should should work. Um, we'll see if we get an exposure message here at the end. We might. So it was able to do that. But that was one that, like, I definitely specifically, like, cherry-picked players where it worked positionally. So, um, yeah, I would try that if you still have trouble and it, like, you don't think that there's a positional issue or something like that, I would say, let me know exactly what your players are. And, um, you can even DM me if you don't want to like post it in the stream or something like that. And I can take a look after here. Um, but Joshua says our showdown single entries, uh, not necessarily single entries. They're single game. They're single games. So. Ryan says, MMA question, is there a limit to the amount of profitable lineups you can make? Like, does it make sense to make anywhere close to 150 lineups? Thanks. Uh, I think it depends. I think on. I think there's an argument to be made that MMA contests have some of the lowest number of overall profitable lineups that can be made, probably like near NFL showdowns, uh, especially if you can quantify accurately how likely a lineup is to be duplicated. You can cross a lot of lineups off just because that lineup's chance of being duplicated is is um is so high i i i i doubt that there's ever 150 or less profitable lineups that you can make even for large field now finding those lineups and figuring out exactly what they are can be hard and if you're building lineups with saber sam and building 150 it's possible that you're entering lineups that are negative ev or neutral ev depending on the card and the contest and and whatever um, the bigger the cards, I think the easier it is to make profitable lineups. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think on like a classic normal sport slate, typical NBA or NFL slate or something like that, there's something I've like heard a number tossed around that there's something like for, for large field contests, anywhere from like 10,000 to 50,000 positive EV lineups that can be made. If you calculate EV using like slate simulations or something like that. It's probably not that high for MMA, but it's also probably not as low as 150 or 100. Um, but I do think in the interest of managing your bankroll and playing as as profitably as possible, I think reversing this and having the approach of saying, looking at every lineup and asking that lineup to prove to you, am I profitable, is a good approach than rather just assuming that all your lineups in the pool are, especially for 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 contests where you're likely to be duplicated. You know, And I know that's maybe a little bit kind of difficult to think about like, well, okay, how do I do that? But like go through the pool of lineups and check in the lineups that that you think are unlikely to be duplicated for one reason or another and, and still retain upside for one reason or another. Maybe the ownership's low, uh, the Sabre score's high, the projected score's high. Maybe it has fighters that based on your research you like overall, right? But ask of each lineup to kind of earn its way into your pool. And if you go through 
however many lineups you have time to do so, and you find that there are 45 lineups that you really want to play, then play 45 lineups. Play 45 lineups that you really like instead of 150, of which 105, you're like, yeah, I'm just playing these because they showed up in the pool. Um, and I think that, I think especially on, on high variance sports where avoiding duplication is really important and, and it's harder to win, right? High variance, like high variance is like harder to realize your expected value on any given slate. I think that makes a lot of sense to do something like that. So Joshua said, I'd rather tie and win than lose and not tie. Uh, yeah, I mean, prop, I, I think in general, that's actually not true. Um, I mean, it depends. There's this like interesting thing that happens in NFL showdown where like, so these sports were, I guess, let me say we're sports where duplication can happen where like, so take the Millie last night. So you're going to have a lot of people playing that contest that are maxing that contest out. It's like $3,000 to enter or whatever it is to max it out. Right. Those people are basically playing for a lineup to win first. That also is duplicated probably at max five times. Otherwise, the contest isn't profitable for them. If the lineup is duplicated any more than that, they're not winning enough back to have made it worth playing. They're not winning enough back for the probability of taking first, for how for how low the probability of taking first was. Like given the odds, the raw probability of any lineup winning that contest as low as that is, 4Xing or 5Xing on the night is not enough if you're playing two to three thousand dollars it takes to max that contest out every night but there's a lot of people playing just one bullet in that contest and if they built the winning lineup and turned twenty five dollars into twenty five hundred dollars they're going to be thrilled even if that lineup was duplicated a hundred times so you almost have like two different people playing a different game here where in in one case you're like yeah i'd rather tie and win and 10x my money and on the other side it's my all of my ev is tied up in building lineups that are not duplicated Although if I do build, if I build lineups that are duplicated, I'm lighting money on money on fire. With all of that said, duplication, being duplicated in a DFS contest, always a hundred percent of the time lowers your expected value of that lineup. And I don't have time on today's show to break down exactly why, but I have before. So on YouTube, on the SaberSim YouTube's channel, right? All the way at the bottom, Office Hours Greatest Hits, the third video in this playlist, why is avoiding duplication important in DFS? I actually like broke down a very basic Google Sheet spreadsheet that mathematically quantifies why being duped tying with anyone means that that lineup was le- was lower expected value than it it should have been. And this is regardless of the results, right? As soon as the cards are flipped over and we see all the lineups, you can kind of actually immediately know if lineups if the expected value of lineups has changed from what they theoretically were based on how often they were to be duplicated. So I would watch that video because it's interesting. So, um, okay, cool. Um, this is another good reason for the NBA showdown thing. Main slate is just ridiculous with predicting what news is coming, late swaps, etc. Yeah, um, I mean, if you don't want a late swap and you're just like tired of dealing with all of it, especially later in the season when it gets typically even worse, um, I think swapping to the showdowns can be a pretty good approach. So. Uh, six said, this is a more of a DK specific question, but curious if you know how to withdraw multiple entries that haven't been drafted, or do you have to withdraw them one by one? You have to withdraw them one by one. If you're doing it manually, the easiest thing to do is to just email support. So, um, I'll show you how to do this. Cause I've had to do this plenty of times and they, they don't make it super easy. So when you're logged in, um, up at the top, click hover your name and then click contact us. This takes you to like their support center, their help, their help center. Um, and then up at the top, click contact support. And then I typically will just say something like withdraw. Okay, you can even see some of my past questions here. Oh no, you guys can't, they're not showing up, but um, withdraw entries. And then I'll typically, so it's tied to your account. They know you're signed in, but I'll typically say like, hi, please withdraw me from and then you just want to specify that especially if you're playing multiple slates in sports you want to specify what you're playing so please withdraw me from my entries in the nba main slate tonight and they'll take care of that it happens in like 15 minutes or less so it's way easier if you have a ton of entries than doing it one by one so jack said hey jordan is it reasonable to think that for each late swap i should change the slider so that as there are less games and less players. My first build requirements are less different than my last build requirements. Um, yeah, I think that can make a lot of sense. 
Um, man, it looks like the the NFL slate is like just totally totally upside down now. I'll have to take a look after this. But anyway, um, yeah, as as news breaks throughout the slate and there are less players, I think it can make some sense to turn down some of the sliders. Um, my best example of that is when big news breaks late. At that point, I don't think players are going to swap optimally. And there are so many positional and salary issues that like, let's say, for example, uh, that let's say Towns is a good example. Let's say Towns gets ruled out after lock, right? Well, if Towns was ruled out before lock, Nas Reed might be 40% owned, right? But after lock, he's only, since it was after lock, he's only going to be 15% owned. I don't care about getting ownership edge on other players at that point. Getting Nas Reed is enough for me. And secondly, if I wanted to own him 80% before lock, but now because of how certain lineups are locked or how salary is used, I can only get him into 40%, right? I don't want to, just for the sake of diversity, make that 30%. So a lot of times as the slate goes on, I will slowly inch down my ownership fade and diverse and variance sliders. And in particular, if big news breaks, significant news breaks, a big name player is ruled out, say, like a top five on the slate value has opened up. I will turn down the ownership fade and the variance slider a fair bit to get more of those guys in. So, All right, let's see if I can figure out what's going on here. Schefter says Seahawks and Rams and, and football team at Eagles are now expected to be rescheduled for Tuesday. What? Okay. And Raiders and Browns will be at five on Monday. So we'll have a, we have a double header on Monday night. What does the main slate look like now on Sunday? So we have no... So is it a, it's a nine-game slate on Sunday? So this game is rescheduled and Seahawks at Rams. So it's a nine nine game slate on Monday here, and two game slate on Monday, two game slate on Tuesday. Is that right? I actually don't even hate that. That actually sounds kind of fun. Um, I mean, uh, again, fingers crossed that like things don't get completely out of control here. But getting the opportunity to play some like both showdown and like some weird high variance classic slates on Monday and Tuesday sounds kind of fun to me. But Tam Tamaka said three games postponed now. Huh. I wonder what's the other one. I'm curious, but all right. Uh, Adam said with sports that all lock at the same time, I download the CSV right after it starts and see how many uniques, the more uniques I have, the better I feel regardless of results. Yeah. Especially for sports where like, you're not really like there isn't actually going to be a big difference in the raw projection of a lineup. I think one of the biggest indicators that you played in a pause of provided that you didn't do something completely silly, right? Provided that you're playing within the bounds of like realistic lineups. If you built lineups on Saber Sim, you know, you know that your lineups are probably realistic enough. Um, I think especially for sports, sports where you're, you're trying to avoid duplication. One of the best things you can do to just try to quickly see how good of a spot you're in is seeing how many uniques you have. Um, I think that's, I think that's pretty sharp. So, but DJ Sirius says without a big bankroll, along with the amount of entries, I've had better luck cashing on tiers and prize picks. Yeah. I mean, I think your, your cash rate is going to be way higher on those no matter what, just cause you're likelier to right? like the, the baseline cash percentages is higher, right? Like if you're playing like a three pick prize picks pick, your average expectation of getting that right is 33%, right? And you're going to three X, it's like playing a triple up, um, but you're just picking against the picks. You don't, you don't, there's, you're not going to three X your money one third of the time in any GPP out there, nor would you want to. That's not really the goal, but same thing with tiers, right? Tiers, smaller contests, um, your, your raw probability of a cash rate is going to be quite a bit higher. So there's nothing wrong with that either, right? Like if, if, you know, if you're the type of player that you want, if you want cash more often, right? Um, I would actually say that playing like props um, is probably one of the best things that you could do because you are going to cash more often. Um, this is a good point too. You're not playing against what is actually a very sharp field, especially in cash contests for DFS, right? Those are tough. So Matt said daily football. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, but, but very, very much fingers crossed that like, this is the extent of it, because I feel like I will totally be, uh, eating my words here if I'm like, oh yeah, we get football 
Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and then then like more more shit comes up. So Josh said no no chalky Cooper Cup. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that's I, I imagine that changes the slate quite a bit here. Um, I'm curious. Like I haven't really studied this slate, but I know the football team. It, so were there was there the Rams had a lot of COVID too, right? That was the other. So it's a it's really the Rams and a football team that were like the kind of two big issues here. So, but six said I've heard of people uh, mention extracting lineups after lock and checking for duplicates, but I've never really looked into executing that process. Is that something that requires an external software? I imagine Adam's doing it in Excel. Would be my best guess. Maybe you've written something to do it, Adam. Uh, I don't know of any tool that is available for like purchase that does this for you. But I think with uh, maybe a pot of coffee and a free half free half of a day or afternoon, maybe you can get it done. Um, some Excel wiz wizardry, but I think it's probably mostly just an Excel thing, right? Like. The easy way I think, I, and this is just literally, I'm sure this is like overkill, but the easy way I would do it is like, you could do, would, would you do, just do like a count if function on every column and see like where, I don't know. I'd have to mess with it, how I would personally do it. But that was my first guess is like doing a, doing a count if with the condition being the player ID in that particular row and then process of elimination, like just see how many, how many rows match your lineup exactly. But I don't know. I'd have to mess with it. So, yeah, Adam says depending on the sport, you can also just wait till the end and sort it by final fantasy point scores. I, I mean, I do that pretty often. I'll go through my contest at the end and look through the standings and see um, how often my lineups were duplicated. But if you wanted to do it before the slate, like after the slate locks, but before anybody is uh, sc sorted, scored, sorry, um, I think that would be the easiest way to do it. So. All right. Cool. We are right at about an hour. I think we got through pretty much everything here today. Talked a little bit uh, of two-game NFL strategy for tomorrow's slate that now doesn't exist. Uh, did the Patriots game get moved? Did they move both games tomorrow? I'm curious. I'll have to, maybe I'll have to check on that on my own. But it sounds like we're going to have some two-game slates throughout the week this week. So maybe a useful segment overall of how to tackle two-game NFL slates. Um, we'll see how everything shakes out. Uh, we talked a little bit about avoiding duplication, getting some lower own plays um, in NFL showdown, MMA, things like that. We talked NBA showdown strategy, um, talked a little bit about managing your player pool, uh, why certain players are removed from your pool, the minimum filters. We talked about uh, establishing a core, establishing a minimum exposure to certain players. So um, hopefully the chaos of COVID stays like a little bit under control and we can at least keep playing some DFS. We'll see what happens here. Um, but until then, enjoy uh, whatever this eight-game NBA slate tonight ends up being. Enjoy the hockey slate if you're playing hockey. Uh, and it is Friday here, so we will be back on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next stream on Office Hours. Until then, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in, asking questions, participating here. Um, and I'll see you guys next week.